is on 1 Peter. And if you recall, the, we did the themes of 1 Peter. I didn't go verse by verse by verse through the entire letter of 1 Peter because Peter doesn't write in a straight line. He kind of pops, he has themes that he writes in and he circles back to them uh, as he goes through them. Uh, there's controversy around Peter's epistles. In fact, so there was a second Peter was almost not put into the biblical canon. Now, when we say the biblical canon, what we mean is your Bible. The Bible that you hold in your hand today wasn't always in English, obviously, and it wasn't always uh, with numbers and verses, and somebody dropped Minnie Mouse up here, so I'm just going to leave that. I think that might have been my daughter. But Around the end of the second century, pretty much the 27 books of the New Testament and the 66 uh, total books were all compiled together. But there was this guy in the fourth, around the fourth century named Marcion who came along and he took a hobby knife to his Bible and he cut out the parts that were hard, the parts he didn't like. And the church decided they needed to have an official Bible, an official canon. And so they decided what books were going to be permanent and what books weren't. And that's why we have the books we have now. Now, the, there are apocryphal books, there are extra biblical books, and there are things that were supposedly hidden. They weren't hidden, they were trash. We just haven't used them for that reason for many years. But that's when we get the Bible, there was this controversy around First and Second Peter because the Greek is so good in 1 Peter. Well, we know why the end of 1 Peter actually tells us. Peter, 1 Peter, was written by a scribe named Silvanus. We learned about him last week. Silvanus rolled with Paul. He was, he was friends with Paul. So he's an educated guy. He writes like an educated guy. So the Greek between 1 Peter and 2 Peter are going to be a little bit different. The Greek in 2 Peter might be a little closer to that of a Galilean fisherman, while the First Peter text is going to be uh, a little more eloquent. So we know all of that. We take that into consideration when we study these books. And what we see really take place at the beginning of First Peter is he wants the church to live in the joy of their salvation. I'll say that again. He wants the church to live in the joy of their salvation. But when he goes to write 2 Peter, he's towards the end of his life, and he actually says this later in our text, after our text. He, he says, I know I'm about ready to be put to death. As Jesus had told me I was going to be put to death, this is happening. So before I go, I want to remind you in a way that you're always going to be reminded with this letter. And so this is Peter's, his last thing he does for the church. And he wants them to have this unshakable joy. Now, if you recall last week, we talked about the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is circumstantial. Uh, I feel happy when I have a, a nice warm pizza and a glass of Mountain Dew and football on TV, right? But that football game's going to end at some point and I got to take out the trash and happiness begins to fade. That's what happens. Happiness is like that. Joy is more than just happiness. Joy is something that rests in Christ. It is unshakable. It is a fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And so we have joy in certain things in our salvation and our relationship with Christ. We have joy like we saw last week in the hope of his return. We have joy as we're going to see today in our salvation. Pastor Calvin next week is going to talk about the joy we have even in our repentance. And then as we go along, joy and grace and faith in Christ. On Christmas Day, we're going to talk about the joy that is Christ. And then in the word and to, in our worship, and finally, even in our suffering, the Christian may experience joy. Now, the reason Peter writes this letter is because that joy is under threat. It's not that people lose their joy, but people can be deceived out of their joy. They can exchange their joy for something else. So these false teachers are coming in, and we're going to see that in verse 2, and what they are going to do is try to exchange the joy of the church for something false, for something more legalistic. Now many times legalism and fruit get confused within the church. Legalism says you have to do A plus B to equal C. But the truth is, whenever we are in Christ, we automatically will do A because the fruit of the Spirit in us, and that will produce C. There, there's no works to it. It is a work of the Spirit in us, not a work we do to gain favor or anything like that. 
That's the difference between legalism and fruit. But Paul also writes about these teachers to Titus. He says that the pastor, and Peter, and Peter is writing, he concluded First Peter as the elder, as a fellow elder, as a pastor, writing to the church. And Paul says that the role of the pastor is to be holding fast to the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to reprove those who contradict. He goes on in verse 11 of, of Titus 1. I think I said first Titus. There's only one Titus. You can tell my brain's already halfway on vacation, right? No, shouldn't be. All right. He also goes on. He says that these false teachers must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of dishonest gain. Now, what is upsetting these families? Should they not have the joy of salvation? Right? Why are they upset? It's because these people are coming in and they're deceiving them and they're weighing them down with false doctrine, bad teaching, legalism, and things like that, and they are exchanging their joy for something else. A false teacher will always try to get someone to measure up to some impossible standard that actually bogs them down. So when we do that, when we are deceived by them, we typically will exchange our joy in our salvation for something that isn't true for something that is false, for something that is a, 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 bad, a, a bad image of the true thing. But we read in our text today, beginning in verse 2, if you have your Bible, 2 Peter ver, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, all the way through verse 12. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure, for in doing these things you will never stumble." For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been strengthened in the truth, which is present with you. And the title of today's message is Joy in Our Salvation or the Joy of our salvation. Joy for the Christian, if you're taking notes and you want to write this down, joy for the Christian increases as we grow in our salvation. Joy for the Christian increases as we grow in our salvation. Like I said, this is Peter's second letter to the church, and it is in many ways a continuation of his first letter. He's going forward. He's building upon what he's already said to them. Now he says at the beginning of 1 Peter, he talks to them about the joy they have in their salvation. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. I quoted this last week when we were talking about our hope in Christ. But he goes on, he says, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. You think salvation is something to have joy in? Yeah. Okay. Somebody's awake? All right. In our text in 2 Peter, he is writing as an apostle, but he's also continuing to write as a pastor. He concluded his first letter that way, and he's, he's beginning with that same thing here, that same thought process, and he is ensuring he wants them to stay on track with their salvation. He doesn't want anyone to deceive them. He doesn't want someone to derail them or take them off the track. Now, the truth is the church today uh, is living in a very sinful culture, much like the church in Peter's day. Some call a church, uh, that we're, they say we're living in a Romans 1 
culture today, referring to how quickly folks in our society will worship corruptible things, and even more specifically, how we exchange what is natural for that which is unnatural. And in spite of this culture, the Christian tries to live for Christ, tries to maintain their salvation in a world that will attack their faith, their joy, their walk with the Lord, like blustery prairie winds. If you don't set your feet, they could knock you off course. How many of you can relate to that after the past few weeks? Yeah? Okay. The Puritan, Thomas Brooks, he once wrote, the greatest thing we can desire is our own salvation, and the sweetest thing we can desire is the assurance of our salvation. He goes on to say, all saints shall enjoy a heaven when they leave this earth. Some shall enjoy a heaven while they are on earth. And the point is, very simply, that we as Christians are all to live as though we are headed towards an eternity with Christ. But there are some who understand and grasp the fact that eternity has began within our hearts at the point of conversion. The point when we have re, uh, rejected the world and accepted Christ, whenever we have submitted ourselves to him. One pastor in my research, he said, I'm afraid so many Christians... Real Christians have so much doubt that they cannot unlock the treasure house of joy because they can't even rejoice in the reality of their salvation. That's where all joy starts. That's what opens the door to your joy in response to all blessing. The truth is, so few Christians experience true joy because many times, and I talked with someone about this just a few days ago or yesterday, I believe, so many times the church wants to make converts and not make disciples. That's not what we're commanded to do. We are to make disciples. We are to teach people and grow them and nurture them in their walk with Christ. Many times what the church does, it says, hey, you want to be a Christian? That's awesome. Uh, also, you have a pretty cool garden. Want to be our landscaper? You know, that's, that's not the progression of a Christian. Put down roots. Make sure that they know the word of God. Make sure they have a firm foundation. And many times we don't like to do that. We want to microwave Christianity. Too many times... Pastors want to preach motivational speeches that get a big response rather than feed the sheep the word of God. And we have to be careful to not do that sort of thing. And Peter, in our text today, he shows us how we are to walk in our salvation, moving forward, advancing as someone who knows they are saved. And again, I say joy for the Christian increases as we grow in that salvation. If we are saved... We understand that we are continually growing in Christ. We go back to verses 2 and 3. It reads, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. I called this message the joy of our salvation our salvation because it belongs to those who belong to Jesus. Our Christianity is exclusive, by the way. People don't like that. They will not all, always lead to Jesus. No, they don't. Always lead to heaven. No, they don't. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus said very clearly in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I'll give you a little newsflash. Every religion is actually exclusive, every single one. Even the ones who say, well, we believe many roads lead to eternity. Well, okay, well, whenever we make a convert of someone from your church and they come and join ours, don't be upset then because they're just on a different path heading towards the same goal, right? No, they get very upset about that. In fact, I can tell you from personal experience, I saw this firsthand when I was in Sri Lanka. We would drive through the countryside and they would say, hey, pull over real quick. Brother Jeff, you should know this church here was burned down by Buddhists. Buddhists, those little short guys you see on TV doing martial arts, right? That's not my martial arts. Wearing the orange robes, shaved heads, wouldn't hurt a cricket, guys. But they will board up a church and burn it down with women, children, and f whole families inside during worship because they are making converts out of Buddhism and into Christianity. It happened. Saw the church with my own eyes. All religions are exclusive. Their way is the only real way. If someone wants to believe that. Some are just more upfront about it than others. Peter knows this. So he starts this letter actually in verse 1. He says, Simon Peter, a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the same kind of faith as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Christianity is exclusive. Exclusive. 
This letter is not for the unbeliever. It's for those who have Christ, for those who have put their faith in him, the same Christ that Peter, the apostles, the early church, this is what they held to. That's not to say the unbeliever should not read it. I want to be very clear about that. That's not to say the unbeliever should not hear its message. It's just that Peter will give the church this letter that has more meaning to those who are going to be re- able to relate to what he's saying. Now, in his first letter, like I said, Peter was writing as a fellow elder, as a fellow pastor, as well as an apostle, and he's continued that way into the second letter. He wants them to understand their salvation, the truth of it. He wants them to have joy in that. Because like I said, false teachers are coming. That's what chapter 2 is all about as it unfolds as you read it. I call chapter 2 of Second Peter the false prophet playbook. It's pretty much their entire game plan. And if you read it, if you study it, you'll understand they were slinking into the church. They're putting up new teachings, bringing new doctrines, uh, doctrines of death. Paul called them, I believe, doctrines of demons. Their excuses to be enslaved once again to sin, placing destructive Uh, apostasies, heresies upon people. So Peter wants them to know the truth so they don't get sucked into the lies. Now, I've been told I've never worked at a bank, so I'm going to look at Wes because he has. But typically, whenever a bank brings on a new teller, they don't give them every variation of a $100 bill and what the false ones all look like. Instead, they give them one good $100 bill and they say, this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. This is what it smells like. You're not shaking your head, so I'm guessing I'm on the right path. So... And and some weirdos, if they're willing, they can know what a $100 bill tastes like, right? You know what the truth is, so you're not caught off guard by the false. That's what Peter is telling them. This is what your salvation looks like. This is what your salvation does. You grow in it. It produces fruit. It does these other things. There's not a legalism surrounding it, but a freedom that's in it. And then he begins verse 2, and he says, grace and peace. Now, we know from last week's message that this means that Peter is writing to a diverse church. Grace is how you would greet the Greek Christian. Peace is how you would greet the Jewish Christian. But it's more than that. He says that the grace and peace should be multiplied to the readers in their knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So it's more than just a greeting. It's a theological statement. Grace is God's favor toward us, which we don't deserve, but it's given to us through his love, which he demonstrates on the cross. Peace is the beginning of the joy we have in God through his grace, that ability to rest in his presence when the rest of the world is in chaos. It's how the Christian stands while everything around them falls apart. Peter's writing this letter to the same churches he wrote 1 Peter to, churches that were scattered throughout Asia, but were in the Roman Empire. They were suffering persecution. They were told to bow the knee to Caesar, to to reject Christ. And much like Paul said to the Thessalonians last week in our message, Peter does not want them to be uninformed. He wants the grace and peace multiplied to the reader in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is one of the things that Jesus himself prayed for when he, on the night he was betrayed, when he was praying to God the Father, he said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Knowledge is a very important part of this letter. In fact, Peter is going to use the word knowledge or some form of it about 11 times throughout the letter. Again, it's because Peter wants them to know the truth and not get caught up in this esoteric knowledge of the false teachers, which leads to immorality. Excuse me one second. The word Peter uses, the Greek word, is the word epignosis. And he's going to use this in reference to the saving knowledge of God, the saving knowledge that one gains in conversion. We're going to see it again in verse 3, again in verse 8, and it even pops up later in chapter 2, verse 20. But he's going to use other variations of that word throughout the letter. Knowledge of God and knowledge of Jesus are connected because God is known to save only through Jesus Christ. We see this earlier in our Bibles. Jesus says to the disciples, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. John reiterates this in his gospel when he says, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. In other words, Jesus is the revelation of the Father to the world. 
Hebrews tells us this very plainly. It's talking of Jesus, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power, who, having accomplished cleansing for sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the revealing of God to his creation for salvation. It is only through Jesus that we can receive salvation. That's what's being made clear. Through his atoning work on the cross, through his resurrection, Peter knows that the readers of this letter understand this. He knows that they know this, that they have been taught this. But he's going to go on and he's going to explain as he writes, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. His divine power is referring to Christ's power. Christ is a source of the, re- of the readers, of the Christian, of the believers, perseverance. That he is the sufficiency of our salvation. That he makes this very clear to us in his deity. He's the same one, we believe that he is the same one in Genesis 17 who appeared before Abraham. Now we have these passages in the Old Testament where God seems to appear as a man in front of people. They're called Christophany. Theophany is when God appears in the Old Testament. Christophany is when the Christ appears as a man in the Old Testament. And we believe that this is Christ because if it was the full glory of God, a theophany appearing before Abraham, it would melt Abraham's face off. That's what he told Moses. Right? So this is the God in the flesh appearing to Abraham to begin Genesis 17. It says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. That phrase, God Almighty, is El Shaddai, or God All-Sufficient. In Genesis 17, like I said, it's, it's Jesus standing there saying this, the person of Jesus in the Old Testament, and he's saying, I am sufficient. I'm all you need. He is sufficient. He's the power that grants everything perter- pertaining to life and to godliness. Through the true knowledge, Peter says true knowledge because the church is in danger of being deceived by false knowledge, people who pretended to know. Peter wants the church to have true knowledge so they won't be deceived by those who claim to have secret knowledge of Jesus. We actually see this at work within the church today. How many of you ever heard of a book or a movie called The Da Vinci Code? Right? One of you? Two of you? Okay. Keep raising hands. We'll just, no, we'll be here all day. All right. These are all getting what? Dessert? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> This secret knowledge comes from a group called the Gnostics. Gnosto, and we saw epignoston, is the Greek word Peter used for saving knowledge, but gnosto is the root Greek word, it means to know. Now the Gnostics believed they knew secret things about Jesus. They did this uh, with other religions. They would take what they could and try to form their own thing that would breed sin and, and licentiousness and things like that. Arrhenius, who is a sort of spiritual grandson of John the Apostle, he writes about these things in his book Against Heresies towards the end of the second century. He calls out the Gnostics for what they do. They weren't exclusive to Christianity, but they they seemed to try and borrow what they could and deceive their followers with this idea that they had some kind of secret info on Jesus. They had some kind of inside track. Gnosticism is very much alive today, even within the church. It happens in different forms. It creeps into the church. It is very deceptive. It sounds a lot like Jesus, but there's always something else to it. People are deceived by Gnosticism when they seek feelings, or they seek blessings, or they seek experiences. When they become enamored with the byproducts of the faith, not seeking Christ himself. That's not the true knowledge of him who called us. It's a desire to have the gifts without having the giver. That's what Peter wants them to avoid. It's what Peter wants them to stay away from. Then he speaks of this call, the call to salvation. Peter says it a few times in his first letter, 1 Peter 1.15, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. In chapter 2 of 1 Peter, he says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. 
1 Peter 5.10. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So Peter knows they understand the call. Jesus himself speaks about the call. He says, many are called, few are chosen. Many are called, few respond. We see this earlier in Matthew, whenever Jesus says in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The joy of salvation begins when we choose to submit to it, when we receive it. We submit ourselves to that call, when we yield to the call of Christ, the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It is a free gift of God offered to all, offered to everyone, but not everybody will take it. Not everybody will receive it. And for the Christian, this is not a cause for sorrow, but of joy if we've received it. And from that point, there there comes a desire to share that joy, especially once we understand it. Peter goes on in verse 4, he says, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Lust robs you of joy. Lust is a substitute and a very poor substitute for love. There is plenty of joy in love, but lust is filled with a false joy. It promises you only things that will rot and destroy you. Lust leads to corruption, but the believer is to have escaped it through the power of the Holy Spirit's work within him. We are partakers of that divine nature, Peter mentions, which is no different than the concept of being born again, being born from above. In his conversation in John 3 with Nicodemus, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Peter also mentions that previously in his previous letter, he says, you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. If you've been saved, you have been born again. There is a change. There is a new thing happening. Paul talks about this in Romans 8. He says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed, we talked about if last week, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Being born again means we are new creatures. We're whole, totally different things. Paul says to the Corinthian church, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And now the Holy Spirit dwells within the believer, within the one who submitted themselves to that call. Paul says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 6, you do not have, uh, sorry, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Because of this transformation that takes place, we will one day receive a transformation that we heard about last week. That time when we are caught up in the air with Christ and the perishable puts on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of sin is death and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is joy to be had in that new birth. There is joy to be had in that salvation. Not that I just get to receive heaven someday, that I get to go play a harp on some clouds. We talked about that last week too. That is not really what it's like. But heaven now dwells within my heart, and that eternity with Jesus begins at that point of conversion. That's a source of joy for the believer that increases as we grow in our salvation. Peter continues in verses 5 through 7. He says, Now for this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. When we read this passage, what we need to understand is this is not a progression from one thing to another. It's a, it's a, a flow of these things out that are bookended by 
that moral excellence and love. They are the two climaxes, but everything in between is also to flow out of the believer. Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, kindness, and love. These all flow from our faith that saves us. These all flow from our faith in Christ, and they're related. Peter's using this rhetorical device in his form of writing that builds from one high point to another, but they all flow from the same source. Faith is the starting point for the Christian life. And we'll get more into that later in the series, but we'll touch on it quite a bit today. We've seen, that, uh, we've seen the effects of faith in other messages recently. Romans 10, 8, and 9. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Remember that faith comes from the Greek word pistis. And it's not a belief that is based on a whim or some emotional moment, but it's based on evidence. Peter, as did Paul to the Romans, he understood the readers had heard the arguments for Christ. They had seen the evidence in the the apostles' miracles and ministry, and they had been presented their own testimonies as well, their own life changes, and they accept the truth of the gospel of Jesus in faith. That's when they became followers of Christ. In the same way, our faith, our saving belief does not come about because, well, I had nothing else better to do on a Sunday and everybody else was walking towards the front. So I figured, hey, I'll raise my hand. I'll go up there too, right? That's not saving faith. That's going with the flow. That may have been a good experience. It doesn't come from some emotional state. Well, I just really felt like I should do it and nothing ever really changed after Well, it wasn't a real conversion, was it? No, faith that that happens, it comes from the heart, the soul, and the mind, from the whole being of the person. It's why Jesus, when he summarizes the first four commandments in Matthew 22, he says very clearly, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The mind is very active in our salvation. It's not something we just turn off and and let everything else happen. Paul even specifies this when he's talking about the Holy Spirit operating within us. He's not saying the Holy Spirit takes over us and takes away our self-control. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit in our life. He doesn't take it away. He gives it. But he says very clearly, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What then is the outcome? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, but I will sing with the mind also. In the same way, the Holy Spirit begins to dwell in us when in faith, our entire being, our heart, soul, and mind submits to Christ. When we believe, when we have a faith that follows him, that submits to him with our entire being, that's what changes That's what brings about salvation. It's why James says to his readers in the epistle of James, he says, you believe that you believe in Jesus. That's great. So do demons and they shudder. See, the difference between a believer is we believe and we bow down. We say, Christ, my Lord, my King. A demon would hear it and shudder. An unbeliever would hear it and say, yeah, I believe that, but it doesn't do anything to me. It drives us to our our knees in in, in submission and from this faith, Paul, or, sorry, Peter tells us we are supplied moral excellence. The, the ESV translates it as virtue. The NIV translates it as goodness. It's actually the Greek word uh, aratin, and it means excellence of character. Paul uses the same exact Greek word when, in Philippians 4.8 when he says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. Now, of those things, would you think that you could find joy in those things? Things that are pure, lovely, honorable? I would think so. If there's any excellence, and that's the word he used, eratine, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. In other words, these are part, this is part of your salvation. This should bring you joy. And with that comes knowledge. We've touched quite a bit on knowledge already, the gnosin, the, the saving knowledge of Christ. Colossians 2.3 says, in whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. And knowledge brings self-control. The Greek word for self-control is inkratin, and it literally means strength over one's self. People do not like self-control. 
our society is not one that likes self-control. If you don't believe me, go home this evening and turn on a football game. Well, I hate football. That's okay. Watch the, for the commercials. That's what my wife does. She watches it for the commercials sometimes. Most of the time she sits there and knits if football's on. Well, watch the commercials. Watch how many of the commercials encourage you to indulge. How many of the commercials are food-based, drink-based, or buy this thing or watch that thing? It's because there's no self-control. Indulge in this, indulge in this. It's, it's something people in our society don't like. In fact, of all the fruit of the Spirit, self-control is typically the one that doesn't ever get preached on or it's always saved for last and not because it's the last on the list. We see even in Scripture that this idea, and it's actually a holdover from our Greco-Roman roots. If we're being honest, the Romans would eat so much they would throw up so they could go and eat some more. They were a, a society that had no self-control. The Greeks worshipped the Greek god Dionysus, the god of drunkenness, and they would drink until they could throw up and then drink some more. We see this in Scripture as well. Whenever Paul's speaking to Felix, he says, uh, Luke tells us in Acts 24, as Paul was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. When I find time, I will summon you. Now, the judgment to come is not changing. It's not shifting. Righteousness, that's something that he would expect from a religious person. What's the part that you think really scared Felix? He might have to exhibit self-control. It's not just the judgment. Self-control is, like I said, by far the least popular fruit of the Holy Spirit. But Peter's very clear. This is a part of your salvation, a part of my salvation. It's something that grows within us. The Christian may not have perfect self-control, but we grow in it. We'll never be sinless, but we are to feel the weight of our sins. The mature Christian may sin less, but they feel the weight of their sins more heavily than they once did. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice in conviction because God is growing us. The faith that grows us in self-control must also allow for the conviction of the Holy Spirit if we're to grow that fruit in our lives. See, many times people don't like conviction because even though it's a good thing to feel, we don't like it because it makes us uncomfortable and we feel condemned or we feel judged or whatever. We, we truly are experiencing conviction in that case, and that's usually a good thing. It means that we are expanding our self-control. And from there we go on and we see perseverance. It's the Greek word hypomonon. It's steadfastness. Steadfastness. There's no T on the end. I don't know why I said it that way. It means being unshakable, unflappable, unwavering in our salvation. Jesus said in Luke 21, he said, by your endurance, and it's the same word, by your endurance you will gain your lives. It's the same Greek word that, that Peter uses as well. It's a determination to see things through. I have faith in Christ. I have salvation in Christ. I will, by the grace of God, I will make it. I will persevere. It's not arrogance. It's not self-righteousness. It's steadfast belief that holds to salvation, which for the Christian is a source of joy. And along with that perseverance comes godliness. Speaking of self-righteousness, right? This is genuine righteousness. The holiness that comes with salvation. It's a, it's a disregard for sin and a clinging to holiness. Godliness is one of those things that Paul and Peter both warn of in the following chapter that people will contort, people will twist, people will try to manipulate in order to advance themselves or, for, or gain financial gain. Paul contends, he says, godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. It's a greater gain than those who would undermine its true worth could ever fathom. Because they use it to advance their own bank accounts or whatever. The true follower of Christ banks treasures in heaven, as Matthew 6 tells us, where moth and rust cannot harm them. And with godliness comes brotherly kindness. Now this is interesting. We have a whole city based on this concept. It's called Philadelphia. The Eagles play there, right? No football fans in this church at all. I, one day, maybe. <sighs> Anyway, <laughs> it's a city of brotherly love. Phileo is, is the Greek word. Philadelphian is actually the word Peter uses here in its full uh, tense. It's a true love for one another that's friendly. It's not sexual in nature. That's the Greek word eros. 
It's a, it's a type of love that looks out for one another, that prays for one another, that tries to keep one another on track, on the right course. And of course, Paul speaks of it in Romans 12. He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. And that sort of kindness, that sort of love breeds the last of all of these Love, agape love is the Greek word, agape. It's the love that forgives. It doesn't hold a grudge, but it chooses to love one another because we have been loved. As Paul writes the Ephesians, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God and Christ has also forgiven you. You see, in all these things, in love, kindness, godliness, perseverance, self-control, knowledge, moral excellence, all of these things are more fruit that is exhibited in the life of a Christian who is saved and a believer of Christ. These, ref these reflect not just, oh, not only Christ, but the character of God himself and the character of God within the believer. That God, the creator of the universe, chooses to love me. He chooses to be kind to me, to help me control myself, to give me knowledge of himself, to train me in kindness towards others. This is moral excellence in knowing how sinful I am and how sinful I have been. And if you're aware of how sinful you are or how sinful you have been, how is that not a source of joy? That God still loves us. That God still blesses us. That God still chooses to grow us in himself. For if these things are yours and are increasing, Peter writes in verse 8, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These qualities are the inevitable result of the faith in Christ that brings salvation. This is the continued joy, the continued growth in Christ. They're not works that we add to our faith so that we can be in right standing before God. They're produced when we are in right standing with God. Paul expands on this further to the church in Rome. He says, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. We are, when we submit to Christ, we are redeemed. We are saved. When we believe in him, when we submit to him, when all our impurities are washed away in the blood that was shed for us on the cross, and we are made new creatures, new creations in Christ Jesus our Lord, how can we not, why would we not, how dare we not have joy in Christ? These qualities are growing within us. And because of them, Peter says, we're not useless, we're not unfruitful in our knowledge of the Lord. We're growing in him, and we continue to grow in him as long as we live, and our joy in Christ naturally grows with these qualities within our lives as well. We will have that joy for all eternity, but it begins in our hearts even now and continues to increase as we grow in Christ. We look at verse 9. It says, For in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. I'm going to read that verse one more time. For in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. Think about just what that says for a second. Do you have joy in your salvation? No, I don't. Well, have you forgotten what your salvation means? Is God not still growing you? Is God not still building you? Is he not still pouring into you? Then you should have joy. And notice this passage, verse 9, is not to an unbeliever. It's to the believer who has been deceived or perhaps uninformed or forgotten where their salvation lies and what their salvation truly means. They've forgotten what that point of salvation did for them and did in them. By contrast, if we are in Christ, if we are saved, verse 8 says these are the qualities that belong to us and are increasing. But if we lack those qualities, we're short-sighted, we're blind. In other words, we have no vision for our spiritual direction. We have become lost. Now, does this mean we're no longer saved? If we stop bearing fruit, if we stop growing, does that mean we're no longer on our way towards heaven? 
Well, the short answer is not necessarily, but we are in danger. Jesus said in John 15, he said, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And the analogy that he gives is that he is the vine, we are the branches. When the branch stops bearing fruit, when the, when the branch stops showing moral excellence, knowledge, perseverance, and so on, when it stops bearing fruit, it's possibly because there's a severed connection to the vine. And every branch that does bear fruit, we're promised a pruning, which isn't easy, but it helps us bear more fruit. Then he goes on in verse 6, John 15, Jesus says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. Keep in mind the purpose of Peter's letter, of Second Peter, was so that the believer understood the joy of their salvation and continued in it so that nobody could deceive them and slip in something else that they would exchange their true joy for something false. But in some cases, that deceiver, that robber, that burglar is ourselves. In some cases, we deceive even ourselves. There may come a time where our self-control is not as evident as our knowledge Our moral excellence is not on par with our kindness or a time where our godliness is not shown in our perseverance or we don't seem very loving at all, much less loving to all. That does not mean we're not saved, but are we trying? Are we still seeking Christ? Are we still submitting to him? Now, you may be sitting here, you may be at home watching, you may be listening to this message as a podcast, and you might be saying, well, this message is about joy and salvation, but there are days I don't feel joy, and there are days where I don't even know if I'm saved. I don't feel saved. And we may have a day, we may have a season where that's the case. But are we pushing through? Are we persevering? Are we still finding time to pray, be fed the word? Are we still coming and surrounding ourselves with other Christians to build ourselves up and to build up others? Or are we just aimlessly walking around blind, nearsighted, lost? Mark Lowry, the Christian comedian. Christmas season's coming up. You should know Mark Lowry, the comedian, wrote the song, Mary Did You Know? Very somber Christmas song. And heads up, she did know. She, if you read the Bible, but, and he acknowledges that. But he tells this story of a time he was asked to go on a fishing trip. And he said he had to get up at four o'clock in the morning. He said he didn't know that there was a four o'clock that came at another point in the day besides four in the afternoon. And he woke up and he was getting ready to get, to get his fishing gear and everything and he stubbed his toe. And he said, in that moment, I realized I didn't sound very saved with what came out of my mouth. I didn't look very saved because I hadn't showered and cleaned myself up. He said, I didn't think saved thoughts in that moment. I didn't smell saved, he says. But I know because of God's grace in that moment, if that trumpet were to sound that we talked about last week, or if he were to be struck dead somehow, he knew he would be in the presence of his Savior. There is the assurance of our salvation through God's grace. This is why emotion-based Christianity is not sustainable. Always looking for the next high, the next fiery sermon, the next heart-thumping worship song, the next moment that gives gives us goosebumps or gets us hyped. Believe me, it is hype. It is not hope. It's why we need a constant walk with Scripture, a constant feeding of the Word, a constant prayer time, a constant time of uplifting one another in Christ so that we feed ourselves the word both our hearts and our minds are being fed it's why the psalmist writes if you ever read psalm 119 it says your testimonies are wonderful where does he get those testimonies in the word therefore my soul observes them the unfolding of your words gives light it gives understanding to the simple i open my mouth wide and panted for i long for your commandments Turn to me and be gracious to me after your manner with those who, you lo- who love your name. Establish my footsteps in your word. And do not let iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. And then he concludes with this. He says, my eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. <laughs> 
He weeps because he knows he can't follow it perfectly. But he goes back to it time and time and time and time again because it is what keeps him on the right path. That is where he finds his true joy in the salvation that is assured to him through Scripture. Peter goes on, he says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure, for in doing these things you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Make certain you are saved. Practice these things, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Are you practicing these things? Ask yourself that. Am I practicing these things? No. Well, no wonder you have no joy. As long as you practice these things, Peter guarantees us, he says, you will not stumble. Why do we practice things? Well, to get good at it, right? Practice makes perfect? Not necessarily. In truth, we practice things. It, again, using sports analogies, I'm sorry if I lose you with these, but look at an old quarterback who goes on a talk show this afternoon. Notice how he grabs the ball so effortlessly his fingers find the spine, the seams. It's because he's practiced grabbing the football that way his entire life. Guys who haven't played in a game for 30 years will pick up a football the exact same way. It's because they practiced it. And because they practiced it, they do it without having to think about it. It's second nature. I'm a Jets fan. Everybody knows that. DeBrickishaw Ferguson was an offensive lineman. His entire career, he never missed a game. He only missed one practice in his entire career. And you can still see that man get down. Bad back, bad knees. He's ruined his body. But he can still get down in a three-point stance like that because he's practiced it. It's second nature to him. Okay, nobody likes football. What about basketball? Michael Jordan. Greatest of all time, right? Air Jordan. Not exactly in basketball shape these days, if you've seen him. But he could still walk on a court, unguarded, shoot shots, make them effortlessly. Why? Because he practiced them. Did practice make perfect? Not in Michael Jordan's case, because his career shooting percentage was under 50%. That means he missed more shots than he made. But he does things without even having to think about them. He has practiced his craft it's not to say Michael Jordan's not very good, but he's not perfect. We practice to make sure we do it without thinking. And if we practice these things that Peter has given us, we never wander. We never find ourselves lost. Now on the flip side of that, John gives us this idea of practicing sin. He talks about that. He says everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. He says little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Suffice it to say, what John is getting at, I think what Peter's getting at, is that we can logically conclude that saved people practice and do what saved people do. Unbelievers practice and do what unbelievers do. And lost people deceived people. They go on being lost and deceived until someone comes along and brings them onto the right path. Hence, Peter says in verse 11, for in this way, in, uh, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. When we are on the right track, that narrow road, that entrance, the narrow gate is easier for us to see, and we cannot help but rejoice as we progress towards it. Finally, in verse 12, it says, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been strengthened in the truth, which is present with you. And here we are. Remember, Peter is writing to the church as an apostle, but also in the role of a pastor. And it's how he concludes his first letter. It's how he opens this one. He says, I will be ready to remind you of these things. Something that a pastor does. It's something that someone who loves the church does not just the pastor. We remind one another. We help steer one another onto the path of righteousness. Church, this is what Matthew 7 is all about. Matthew 7 is one of the most tragic chapters of the Bible in our society because it gets ruined. It gets twisted and contorted. The sad truth is people read the first verse of Matthew 7 and they say, well, that settles everything right there. Matthew 7, 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Boom, can't touch me. You can't judge me, right? Ha, 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 ha. I know the Bible. You know one verse out of context, right, Georgette? 
No, no, no. Context is key. Matthew 7 is all about making sure we judge one another rightly, that we stay on the right path and we stay on the right path together. Jesus goes on, he says, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? Behold, the log is in your own eye. In other words, the idea is very clear. If we don't take care of our own spiritual walk, we have a log in our eye, and we try to help someone else, we're both going to be blind before it's over. We're going to ruin someone else's spiritual walk as we're ruining ours. So we judge one another rightly. We take out what's hindering our walk. We try to overcome that, and then we go and help other people. Otherwise, we're both going to be lost. And if we aren't supposed to judge rightly, then why does Jesus go on later in that same chapter, verses 15 and 16, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. For you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Now, wouldn't knowing them by their fruits? Today, people would say, well, you're judging them. I think Jesus is judging them when he says they're false prophets and tells us it's okay. Judge them by their fruit. And we are to judge, but we're to do it rightly. We're to do it grounded in the word, knowing what God did actually say. We're to do it lovingly. We're to try and bring others onto the right track, growing them in moral excellence, because if we're saved, we want others to be saved. We want our joy to be their joy as well. If we're experiencing the joy of salvation, we want to be reminding others of these things, even if they already know them, to make sure they don't forget them. Because the joy we share in salvation is not just that one day we're going to go to heaven and then we're going to be happy for all eternity. No, it's that we can experience heaven in our hearts and have joy now. Our joy increases as we, as we advance together towards eternity. Church, there is joy in our salvation. I'm going to conclude in just a second. The assurance of our salvation, that we keep growing in it, there is joy to be had in that. If we could have the worship team come back up. We may not always feel joyful. We may not always want to rejoice, but our, our joy increases as we grow in our salvation. We can know that we are saved by what we believe and what we love. Do we believe the truth of God? Do we rest in the word that he delivers to us? Do we believe the one that it testifies about, about Jesus Christ? Someone once said, that kind of love isn't about sentiment, it's about lordship. Is he Lord of our lives? Is he king of our lives? And do you find fulfillment? Do you find joy in Christ? Maybe you're here today and you don't feel that joy. Maybe you feel like your salvation is waning. Maybe you've been watching or listening online and, and you question your salvation. Maybe you're hearing this message and you're saying, well, I think I'm saved, but I've never had that joy. I don't see that fruit in my life. I don't see evidence of any change from before Christ. Then today I would challenge you where you are, take some time and pray. There's nothing wrong with asking the question, do I believe? There's nothing wrong with asking God to strengthen your faith. In fact, in Mark, in Mark 9, a man says to Jesus, help me in my unbelief. And he's not reprimanded for that. He's not scolded for it. In fact, Jesus helps him in his unbelief. If you'd like prayer and you'd like to come forward, you're more than welcome to. We would have our prayer team pray with you. But the worship team is going to lead us in a song. And I would just ask you, challenge you, if you're struggling to find joy, if you're struggling to, to realize your salvation even, spend some time where you are. Pray. And when you're done praying, join us in the song and, and we'll do a prayer of dismissal. And, and of course, we'll have a time of fellowship after. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with the